Welcome back. Welcome back to Think Tech. I'm Jay Fidel. Uh, we are joined today by Emily Medina of Eprink. She's in Mexico City. And we're going to talk to her about uh, Joe Biden in Mexico and how they will connect or not. Welcome to the show, Emily. Nice to see your smiling face. Hi, Jay. Great to be here today with Think Tech Hawaii. Always a pleasure. So, you know, I think sometimes people in the U.S. forget that uh, the world watches our media and probably everything that I can get here in Honolulu, you can get in Mexico. Um, all the cable channels, all the news, all the programs and all the, you know, all the print press too, uh, and the websites, whatnot. And I think we forget that sometimes, but that means that you are presumably as well aware of what's going on as we are. Um, and the question then is how you feel about it. So um, obviously we have, we're in crisis, we're in a constitutional crisis. This is always troublesome for a constitutional democracy um, to have people throw aside the constitution and uh, you know, undermine the Republic is what's, what's happening. And um, you know, Mexico is, uh, you know, Mexico is close to us and we're close to Mexico. It, for a lot of people, including me, we're closer to Mexico now than we were before. Trump has somehow made us closer and more appreciative of Mexico. I want to see Mexico succeed. I want to see a better, closer partnership relationship with Mexico more than ever. Um, so I'm very interested to know how you feel and how the country feels about what is going on in our constitutional crisis. So let's talk about you first, your reaction. How did you find out about this? When did you find out about it? What was your reaction? What is your reaction now? Well, I mean, we were following the U.S. elections very closely here in Mexico. Um, you know, it lasted a whole week. It's been a lot of suspense and it's, it's been very, very tied. And there's no doubt about it. And, you know, when we found out about the results, I think it was Friday, Saturday, um, you know, uh, it seemed pretty obvious at that point um, that the victory, um, you know, um, the, the Biden resulted, you know, the winner of the elections. Yeah. So how do you feel about it? Well, I am optimistic about this new chapter in U.S.-Mexican relations. Um, I believe that, you know, this will freshen up the relation that's been um, pretty stagnant over the, you know, past few years, given, you know, that Mexico wasn't, you know, Trump's priority, um, you know, during his administration. So right now- well, I think I, you're being very nice about that. Uh, <laughs> I, I, I would put it differently. I would say he, he, he took every opportunity to beat Mexico up for reasons that were never, ever clear, um, just to make a scapegoat out of Mexico and, and Mexican people. Uh, and the Peshlug in a wall. Let me digress for a moment and ask you, <clears throat> does this mean maybe we can take the wall down? Should we take the bloody wall down? Well, you know, on the downside is that right now, Mexi the Mexican president has, you know, has toughened his position on, on, on migrants. You know, he's increased um, the presence of militarized police in the border with Central America, as well as in the northern border with the U.S. So right now, you know, although Trump, um, you know, will be replaced um, in the incoming months, um, we're going to see, you know, um, how AMLO reacts to this change, which will be interesting because um, during Trump's administration, he's, um, I would say he's had a good relationship with Trump and aligned in many of his policy approaches, including increased, um, I wouldn't say so much security, um, but, um, you know, increased militarized, um, you know, pressure. Was that, was that AMLO's uh, own idea or was he just getting pressured by Trump? He was um, getting pressure by Trump, who threatened to um, to increase in, in Mexico. You say um, aranceles, but in, in the U.S., you say something like you know, a taxes on uh, Mexican imports. Uh, uh. 
Yeah, okay, right. He didn't want to be involved in a one-sided trade war, which Trump was exactly. doing all, all through his administration. Um, so, okay, so then, you know, so we don't really know what AMLO will do. Maybe, maybe he'll linger in, in favor of whatever Trump was putting pressure on. I hope not. I hope he takes a fresh look at this. But, you know, what about the rest of the government? What about the people? I mean, you know, like in, in, in France, the, the mayor of Paris uh, tweeted out to the world. She said, quote, welcome back, America, which <laughs> is very, very touching. <laughs> <laughs> What do the people in Mexico think about that? I think um, people in Mexico want to see uh, a stronger dialogue with the U.S. than what we had in the past, which was a very transactional approach between the Mexican, between AMLO, the Mexican president, and Trump. You know, so they've had a sort of a transactional relation that I think many in Mexico are right now, you know, looking forward to having back a multilateral relation. You know, one of the remarkable things to me, many remarkable things have happened in, in recent weeks, but uh, one of the remarkable things is, is somehow Trump was able to turn the Latinos in this country, uh, many of them, to vote for him. Uh, this is after he has chased them around in the middle of the night with, uh, you know, with Homeland Security arrests and incarcerations and, and the Dreamers, you know, pull the Dreamers program and just one thing after another, where he has discriminated against them and, and called them rapists and, you know, on and on and on. We could spend the whole show just identifying all the things that he has done to, you know, beat up Latinos. And yet, uh, at the end of the day, he was able to get a lot of Latinos to vote for him. Do you understand that? Do you, you must have thought about it because it is quite remarkable that they would have turned around and voted for somebody who was not serving them at all, who was serving against them. Uh, what, what do you think about that? Yes, to be honest, I do not understand it at all. <laughs> um, you know, and if you see um, most of the Latino voters in voting for Trump um, were based in Florida. So a lot of people, you know, um, especially, um, you know, from Cuba and other Venezuela and other parts, I, I guess, um, you know, the the struggles they face politically in their countries, um, you know, with, um, you know, different political approaches, in, like communist approaches and what have you. I think Trump used that message of, of actually, you know, saying that the Democrats were leaning communists and, you know, all that to, um, to target that population and have them, you know, actually vote for him. So that is my, you know, my opinion. And, and, you know, to be honest, I don't really understand the, you know, the reason, the true reason behind um, the Latinos voting for Trump. Yeah, I don't, I don't understand it either. We have a show um, every couple of weeks with Carlos Juarez, who is a Hawaii academic, but who spends a lot of time in Mexico and overseas in general. He, and um, I asked him the same question, why? And he said, well, you have to understand that, um, that the Latinos, it's not, it's, monolith, it's not monolithic. There are various groups within Latino and they may feel different. And I suppose your point about the Cubans is very interesting. And, and one thing it sort of strangely connects is that, is that early in his administration, uh, Trump reversed all the things that Obama had done to reconnect with Cuba. Uh, and it, you know, it looked like we were gonna have a robust and friendly relation with Cuba on so many levels and you know, welcome back Cuba, if you will. <laughs> and the Cubans would say, welcome back America. But that, that is all dried up now because Trump has, has been dumping on Cuba ever since he was elected. And maybe you know, the Cubans in Florida who are still mad um, you know, about Castro and the like, maybe, maybe they encourage Trump to do that. And maybe he does it in order to, um, you know, have, have them support him, you know, to assuage them. 
in some way so that they support him over, over the issue of Cuba. But it's really strange and it, it, um, it belies one, one lesson that I've learned about it. The people too often in this country these days in the modern America, um, they don't see the national interest. They don't see or respect um, the wishes of, of their brethren. Uh, they only see their own interest, which leads you to a fragmentation. And I, and I wonder how, you know, I mean, is this recognized in Mexico? Do people understand that we are fragmented? Do they understand that we are having arguments about everything? You know, 86% of the people who voted for Trump still today feel that Biden stole the election because there was widespread fraud in voting, which is no, no substance to that, no evidence of that. And yet 86% of the people who supported Trump feel that way. This is what I would call divisive, but meaninglessly, there's no reason for it. And yet it's divisive. Do people in Mexico understand the process, the troubles we are having in trying to come together? Well, you know, it's interesting because I think it's a global trend that we're seeing, you know, this increased polarization of populations and, you know, division and embedded division, you know. And, and I think this a, a large uh, is largely due to the role that the media plays, you know. Um, but more importantly, the uh, undermining of the media by the own government. And we see that in Mexico, we see that in the US, you know, where, um, you know, they undermine the media and they try to discredit the media by saying that, um, you know, that there's fake news when in reality, you know, facts are facts. And so I think this is playing a, a, an important role in in creating division amongst populations and not only in the US, but also in Mexico. It's been, ah. this trend has been increasing under AMLO who in his morning uh, conferences, um, which he holds every day, um, he basically discredits the media who criticize him. And, and this undermines our, um, our democracy and our institutions. Oh, I'm so sorry to hear that. Uh, ooh, so he's, he's picking up on where, where Trump is showing him the way. Exactly. And, and he's not the only one. I think it's a lot of, a lot of uh, leaders, especially right-wing leaders, are, are following up on that. Too bad. Uh, I hope that when Biden you know, gets into office, uh, AMLO will change his way of doing business as, as he should. You know. Yes, uh, I hope so too. <laughs> So has Biden, uh, or rather has AMLO uh, um, recognized Biden's election? Has Mexico made a, a, an international statement that it accepts the re results? And many countries have, and it really shows you, uh, you know, what side of the coin he's living on. Has he? So at this point, AMLO has not um, acknowledged um, Biden's victory. He is um, waiting until he sees that, you know, that it's all of the legal um, implications are in place. So for him to actually go and um, acknowledge uh, the victor of the election. That's troubling. Of course, I think Biden will probably forgive him for it. He's a forgiving person, but, you know, another, another person. But it, but it prevents, you know, further cooperation, kind of, um, it puts us on the wrong foot, you know, um, of uh, what could be a, a very good next four years in our relation with the U.S. Um, because right now, um, as the Biden's team begins to um, take place and the transition of power begins, um, you know, it just um, officials on Biden's team and requested to have a, a phone conversation with AMLO's team and they rejected that call in the side of Mexico um, because they haven't um, acknowledged his victory. So this is troublesome and because um, 
we are losing time that we could be using to cooperate on health issues, environment issues, energy issues, and what have you. And especially on the economic recovery, you know, that we have to um, take care of after the, the pandemic. Yeah, well, you're still, you're still in a pandemic too, just like the US. Are you doing better or worse in, you know, percentages uh, than the US is doing? Well, um, the cases are still increasing. Our number of deaths right now are about 95,000 um, the reported deaths, um, although I'm sure the toll is way higher than that. And they estimate it to be three times higher than what it's reported. Um, so we're still, um, you know, um, under severe stress from this pandemic and we haven't and recovered from it in one bit. Yeah. So are, are um, people, you know, uh, is there a national initiative about masks and distancing uh, and uh, tracing and tracking and the like? So Mexico um, does require you to wear a face mask in several states. Um, it's mandatory to, to have a face mask. And, and this is helping, you know, um, withhold the virus. Um, however, there's a lot of use of public transportation and, you know, so this, you know, increases um, the risk of people getting COVID and what have you. Yeah, sure. Are, are, um, are people out of work? Have they lost jobs? Uh, and if so, uh, is anybody helping them pay the bills? Yes, there's been a huge job loss here in Mexico, and unfortunately, the government um, has not provided any help um, with ha has not provided any aid um, to you know to citizens, and he they haven't you know provided aid even for the private sector. So it's kind of each man to its own. Yeah. Okay. So the. Um... The economy has been hit hard, but what about energy? I mean, for example, and this is a question that came in from a viewer. In the United States, the solar stocks started to rise. Um, in fact, all the stocks <laughs> started to rise when Biden was elected, when, when it, you know, it, it became uh, you know, national news. W what hopes do you have uh, for the future of mm, the economy, the stock market, solar stocks, clean energy, uh, now that Trump is gone? And I guess that's a hard question because he's not really gone yet. Uh, mm -hmm. But could you talk about how you see the future in the Mexican stock market and its reaction? I'd like to know what its reaction was to Biden's election and in clean energy, of course. Well, right now we're seeing you know, a big push in the energy transition and I think this is going, I mean, right now, um, there's a lot of pressure in, in the oil market because of the collapse in the oil prices that we saw earlier in the year. So the oil industry is really um, um, going through, you know, uh, difficult times. Uh, however, um, I don't think that we're going to see a shift, an immediate shift, you know, from oil to renewables as soon as Biden takes office. It's going to be a gradual transition. And I think, I mean, um, I mean, Biden has been very clear in his environmental and energy agenda. And he's basically um, pushing for um, investments of two trillion dollars in building um, clean technologies and energy infrastructure but it's going to take time i don't think we're going to see you know um, an immediate shift um, especially because a lot will depend on who holds the senate majority in terms of uh, how spending gets done yeah so what about Mexico itself? And is Mexico um, supporting that both the government and the people supporting solar? Is, is solar growing? Uh, was it growing in 2019? Is it growing now? And you know, Hawaii, we have 
we have a very robust solar market, believe it or not, even during COVID. Uh, how about Mexico? Well, Mexico um, is one of the 10 countries in globally with the highest potential in renewable energy. However, um, this government <laughs> does not, um, is not in favor of renewable energy. Um, they've clearly um, said, you know, that they think that renewable energy, to put it in, sophisma is what he said it, renewable energy is, which is basically saying that um, it's a myth that, you know, uh, you know, renewable energy is not as great as, you know, people say it is. So, you know, he discredits renewable energy and he's undermined investment in further um, building renewable energy projects because um, he, right now, a lot of um, our, en our main energy regulator, Comisión Reguladora de Energía, is basically in court um, with several energy companies um, because they've suspended a lot of renewable energy projects. On what basis? On the basis that it caused uh, on reliability, reliability on the grid, which there's no evidence for that. Mm. What is it with him? Does he is he uh, opposed to? Uh... Does he not believe in climate change? Does he not care about carbon emissions and greenhouse gases? Does he not think that Mexico has an obligation, as all countries do, uh, to deal with climate change? What's his thought process? I think he is more interested in, in his political agenda than on any climate agenda. Um, because, um, you know, Mexico's identity is very is linked to to our oil sector in many ways. Um, you know, Pemex is a, a a symbol of you know of our you know national strengths and what have you. Because you know, in earlier on when it was created, it um, expropriated all or foreignly owned oil assets in the country to create Pemex. You know. So basically, um, AMLO right now wants to capitalize on Pemex, on CFE, both state-owned oil and energy enterprises. And because, you know, there are national symbols. So this is very popular in, his, um, in terms of, you know, um, uh, on, on getting, um, you know, political support from voters who, you know, uh, our workers in Pemex and CFE or who, you know, just um, have a very strong national identity. Mm -hmm. well, 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 what about the other voters? I'm wondering if you have a constituency in Mexico uh, that believes in climate change, that wants to do something about climate change, that cares about uh, renewable and clean energy and so forth, uh, that votes the other way, that voted against him, and that would, um, you know, try to support and promote uh, an expansion of clean energy. Is, does those, do those groups exist? Uh, are they in the newspapers also? Do they vote against him? Um, do they have, um, what do you call it, rallies and, and, and events to demonstrate their, uh, their feelings on the matter? Well, actually, um, you know, we have several NGOs um, in Mexico who are working um, to, you know, combat these issues in the court, and they've already been successful. You know, we've had um, our judicial system, you know, has um, in many ways uh, stopped uh, a lot of the, the, the proposals that were, you know, sent to the courts in terms of um, suspending renewable energy projects. So, you know, um, actually, um, what's it called um, the environmental organization Greenpeace, of course, everybody knows Greenpeace. Um, so they actually um, were successful on on suspending this issue in the courts, and 
you know, we do have, you know, a strong presence of NGOs in the country and, and also the private sector is um, pretty much involved in these issues because um, it matters to their investments. And, and also in the international community, um, I think should put more pressure on Mexico to actually um, meet its, um, its objectives under the, the Paris Agreement. Is, um, is Mexico a party to the uh, uh, Conference of the Parties, uh, the Paris Agreement? Yes, Mexico um, is, uh, is a party to, to that um, agreement. Uh, however, I think we're going to be sure to meet our first target, which is to increase our share of renewable energy to 35% by 2024. Right now, we're at about 18%, I believe. Um, so we're, I think, going to be short in meeting that goal, and yeah. especially because uh, this administration has, you know, um, put so many obstacles in the implementation of a lot of renewable energy projects and an interconnection of transmission lines that are important to be able to bring that renewable energy capacity up to the grid. So uh, <clears throat> when, when is AMLO's term up? And do you think um, he will win again um, uh, next time? So he still has four more years to go here in Mexico elections or um, terms, presidential terms last um, six years. So he still has four more years to go. Um, and, you know, uh, hopefully with, you know, the change in administrations in the US, we are going to see a uh, change in messaging coming from the Mexican president in terms of his approach towards uh, the environment and towards many different issues, including, you know, um, security issues and all across the border. Yeah, sure. Well, we only have a couple of minutes left, Emily, and I wanna ask you my, my two last questions here. <clears throat> okay, so what is your advice to Joe Biden about dealing with Mexico. Let's assume for a moment, you know, that soon enough he gets to be the president, uh, Knockwood. Um, what is your advice to him about how to deal with Mexico, how to realize, you know, our destiny with Mexico? Wow, that's a, a good question. Well, I think my suggestion to Biden would be to be very patient. <laughs> And with Mexico, especially with you know the Fed and the, the government, um, his views do not reflect the views of all Mexicans. And so, my suggestion would be to be very patient and to actually um, to increase um, cooperation in, in all different areas and increase dialogue with Mexico to be able to face some of the biggest challenges that we have today, including the COVID pandemic and climate change issues. Okay, and then the, and, and flipping it to the dark side, what's your advice to Trump? What advice would you give him at this time uh, when the constitution of the United States is under such broad-based attack? Oh, wow. Um, could you repeat that question? <laughs> That's, it's kind of, you know, surre surreal to be, you know, actually, you know, it is surreal. hearing that question. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And your advice? Well, my advice would be um, in terms of how he faces this um, legal, ba legal ba battles would be, um, to just, um, you know, um, to listen to the institutions and respect the institutions and the rule of law. There you go. Thank <laughs> you, Emily. <laughs> Emily Medina, our good friend in Mexico. It is so nice to talk to you and I so enjoy our conversations. All the best to you, Emily. And Thank stay you, safe. Jay. Always a pleasure. Aloha and vaya con Dios. <laughs> Aloha. <laughs>